Hi, uh, let me make sure I'm here in the camera. Um, my name is Paco, and uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, an open source project. We started this out for uh, taking a look at the community around Apache Spark, but um, now I'm doing some work with it at uh, O'Reilly, trying to look at open source communities for a number of different frameworks, and really start to understand some of this, the structure and the dynamics of what goes on in a developer community by analyzing a lot of their discussions. Um, Lorena, uh, Lorena Barbara in the keynote this morning had an excellent section about uh, discourse analytics. And uh, this is an attempt towards some of that, at least applying certain techniques toward that. Um, pretty early stages, but the code's up on GitHub and uh, it, it is generalized enough to be able to work with a, a number of different uh, developer communities. So uh, it, part of this is based on Spark, so I'll ask, uh, how many folks have used Spark before? Okay, more folks using Spark, that's great. Uh, well, that's like 50-ish percent. Um, one of the, the main ideas of Spark is it, it's a great framework for handling uh, big data, batch jobs like you would do with Hadoop, but some of the constraints are relaxed, and so not only does it handle batch, but it can also do some interactive work and some, some iterative work. Uh, there's ways to use it for streaming. Uh, it's based off of functional programming and leveraging closures in a, in a, uh, to, to describe a pipeline. <clears throat> and that works very well with, uh, with Lambda uh, expressions in Python or uh, you know, uh, uh, also closures in Scala and, and R. Uh, consequently, you can translate from SQL uh, queries into functional programming. .NET does this with something called Link, and uh, Scala really borrowed ideas definitely from that. Um, you can also do machine learning, graph algorithms. I'll show some of this in a bit. Uh, so Spark is kind of a generalized uh, framework for a lot of different types of big data processing. And I think one thing that really says it strongly is uh, Hadoop was really based off of 2002. Uh, Google was uh, having troubles with spinny disks when they had thousands of servers in a cluster, and they wanted a fault-tolerant uh, kind of framework to get large-scale jobs run over the top of that. And so they came up with GFS, they came up with MapReduce, Hadoop, of course, is an open-source implementation of MapReduce, uh, but it was really based off of some of the trade-offs in engineering back in 2002, 2003. Uh, Spark came along a decade later. And uh, you know things have really changed in open source. Sorry, in commodity hardware, things have really changed. Uh, comparing 2003 with say 2010, uh, you know, a decade later we have multi-core, large memory spaces, SSDs, uh, much faster networking, and uh, but still we have a lot of servers fail. Um, so Spark is a way of providing fault tolerance, but really using about a decade later generation of hardware. Um, and one of the things is that Spark last year, uh, the team took the, uh, the world record in the gray sort challenge, a uh, 100 terabyte sort, and it had previously been held by Yahoo using Hadoop. And the uh, Spark team was able to do it with a cluster that was one tenth the size and three times as fast. And uh, they scaled it out to a petabyte, and they still saw a pretty nice linear ramp, about a 30x improvement on most of the metrics across the board. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a lot of what's going on with Spark. It is, it's more recent and leveraging functional programming. Um, one of the things you can do with Spark, as I mentioned, was graphs. So if you have a graph that you want to define in terms of a set of nodes, and then another set of the edges that connect them, uh, in Spark, the basic data abstraction, low-lying data abstraction, is called an RDD, a Resilient Distributed Data Set. It's a collection. You can think of it as a fault-tolerant collection that you can apply functions to. Um, so if you take, an, take a graph, you can represent it as an RDD of the nodes and another RDD of the edges connecting them. You compose that into a graph object and then you can apply functions to the graph object and the result set that comes out is an RDD. Uh, so graphs work very well. Uh, this came out of uh, implementation of GraphLab API or parts of GraphLab API, uh, along with uh, an implementation of, uh, if you've ever read the Pragle paper from Google. Um, and so really inheriting 
from uh, GraphLab, uh, this would, uh, GraphX uh, really leverages graph parallel systems. That would be the, the class of problem that would fit well. Um, in the case of Spark, what's very interesting there is how well it integrates with the rest of the workflow. So for instance, you might use, say, Spark SQL to be doing your ETL, preparing your data to put into the graph. Or you might have Spark Streaming, where you're taking in live feeds off of receivers and annotating, updating your graph. Um, or it might be that after you've done some kind of graph query, you run some predictive modeling on the results. Uh, so Spark is very good at integrating these pieces because it has this kind of common substrate. Uh, here's some of the papers too. Joseph Gonzalez, who was a postdoc at Berkeley, uh, uh, the original graph paper there, Power Graph paper, and uh, the Pregel paper from Google, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here's how you can build graphs. Uh, here's a node RDD, an edge RDD, and they both have a type signature. So there's some type of data associated with the node, some type of data associated with the edges, and then you compose them into a graph object. Uh, now, this is, of course, not Python, uh, but I had an example here in Scala. Uh, graphics itself, so far, doesn't have a full Python binding, uh, so generally it's Scala. But it's a, a simple traversal run on, on a graph that I've built. Um, more complex kinds of graphs would do optimizations. So for instance, there's an implementation of uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, if you have, say you're looking at Google Maps and you're looking at your, your starting point and maybe three possible destinations, what's the cost of going through different routes to get to a, a given destination? Uh, Dijkstra's algorithm could calculate that kind of thing. Uh, typically it would be called a single source shortest path. Um, but it's the kind of thing that Google Maps does all day every day. FedEx, UPS, all these routing uh, problems, again, they use it all day every day at scale. Um, I'm going to scoot through some of the Scala parts of this. There's really a lot of graph work there. I'll get to an uh, implementation part later, um, partly because of time here. One thing, though, I will say is that graphs are very interesting for a wide range of data. Um, here, I'll be showing them for some natural language processing in kind of a different way than is usually done. But a lot of real-world problems fit graphs. And so if you're looking at optimizing sales in, in uh, you know, a funnel kind of analysis, that can be a graph. If you're looking at supply chain, that can be a graph. So a wide range of data is, of course, linked data. And many of these will satisfy uh, graph parallel systems, and they can be run well in something like GraphLab or, or GraphX. Um, another thing is that graphs can generally be converted into sparse matrices. And a lot of times, it may be more efficient to just convert them and then run parallel algorithms on your matrices. Um, for instance, Facebook uh, uses Giraffe, Apache Giraffe. And they have trillion element graphs, and they're you know, very proud of showing what they can do there. Twitter came along a little bit later after Facebook, and rather than investing into really large-scale graph stuff, they uh, instead invested into AlgebraBird and Scalding and, and ways of doing uh, very efficient parallel processing on matrices. Um, so I'm not going to go into that too much, except that, uh, well, if you have a graph, say you have four points there, you can convert it into a matrix. And then you can start to do fun linear algebra kinds of things with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, et cetera. Factorizations, all that. Um, let's get, oh, there is one thing I will say, though. I, I've definitely been trying to seed this notion. Um, if you have a graph that's more complex, that doesn't just have one attribute on each edge, maybe it has multiple edges between the same nodes, maybe multiple kinds of attributes, something that's collecting a lot of different data, a very, very rich kind of graph, then you wouldn't typically be doing work with matrices at that point. Uh, I mean, you can, can't, you can, you can kind of shoehorn it into that. I've seen those attempts. Uh, generally not a good idea. Uh, not a general purpose case kind of thing. But if you're talking about complex graphs with multiple types of connections on them, tensors are the general case. And uh, what's interesting is there is a lot of work, or there's some very interesting work with general case uh, tensor factorization at scale, some of it on Spark. Uh, Anima Anankumar at, at Irvine, I think, has uh, some of the better presentations about this. Um, and if so, graph algorithms will start to become very, very, very interesting, because it will knock down a lot of real world cases. So watch that case, especially. Um, and I think we're kind of on the cusp of that. 
So getting to the heart of this one, there is a project called Exto. It's up on GitHub and it's about insights into developer communities. Um, the idea is that we have a very rich set of data uh, in terms of the email forums that uh, developers for a particular project are using. So if you're talking about Apache Spark, there's user, uh, dot, user at spark.apache.org, or there's dev at spark.apache.org. And the project itself really tries to reinforce that. Uh, the committers are active in these forums every day. They handle all kinds of newbie questions. Uh, they're really, really engaged. And when people come and ask questions about Spark and other channels, they usually say, you know what, go to the email form. Um, so it's a, it's a very rich way of, of taking a look at what's going on with the developer community. So we started thinking about ways to leverage some data mining. Now, when you look at the email lists, there are sequences, there are threads of email, and there are sequences of messages along these threads. Somebody starts them, other people start answering, and pretty soon when you follow the trail of that, you've got a graph. Um, so you can think of this graph structure of the senders and the receivers of an email form. That's interesting. You've also got timestamps on this data. So all the messages are sent at a particular time or received at a certain time. So you've got graph data, you've got some time series data. Um, and of course it's text, so there could be interesting things with natural language, uh, you know, as far as parsing it, uh, some semantic uh, analysis, uh, maybe some sentiment analysis, things like that. Uh, so what we did, uh, we came up with a project called Exto, and let me bring this up over here. Um, that's probably, is that big enough to read? Vaguely? Okay. Um, it's called Exto, and the thing is you can point it at pr pretty much any um, Apache developer community, the email forms for them. They tend to all follow the same pattern. Uh, there's the archives that Apache has. <clears throat> so you can just point it at a different URL and, and start to crawl a different list. Of course, we were doing this for Spark, but it can be applied to others. Um, now, uh, the other thing is that here's a paper that part of this talk is based on. It's from Radha Milhasia at uh, UMichigan now. Uh, she had formulated using PageRank to do some text analytics. I'll show this in a moment. Um, and actually, here's, here's an, a sample bit of data. If you go to, uh, I don't know, let's look at Jan, Jan 1. There we go. So TD. My friend Tathagata Das, uh, who leads on Spark Streaming, here's like, I guess, the first message of the year. Um, so, you know, scraping these is not too much of a problem. Uh, cleaning up the text is a little bit more problematic. There's one other data source in this, and that is right here. It's a Google Doc. And uh, we just, we keep track, although I'm a few days behind here, uh, we keep track of the different meetups and conference talks about Spark around the world. And so we've been doing that since last October. We have a nice little backlog there, um, which is interesting because now we can do some analytics about, you know, what speakers are speaking most frequently, what companies are most engaged, what are the topics, what are the cities, things like that. And uh, I think it's very interesting when you start to put together uh, some learnings about the developer community because of the email forums, but then be able to join this with some other learnings from, say, the meetups. Okay. So um, first I'm going to focus on looking at the email list archives and being able to, well, show the pipeline for being able to crawl this and parse it. Um, and uh, a couple things are, are important here. This is one of the most active projects at Apache it comes out to being about 2,000 messages per month. That's not a lot of data points, per se. Uh, and each email message is not that large. Um, really, it works out to being an average of about 18 megabytes per month. This is when the you know, email list has been crawled, <clears throat> and each email message is represented as a JSON document. Um, so 18 megabytes per month, that's really, that's kind of trivial. I mean, I can definitely fit that onto uh, you know, a USB stick. Um, if we take a look at what's actually in there, six months of activity will start to build a graph that's a bit more complex than that, though. There is about 2,000 senders. And uh, if we start to build up uh, a representation of, of the topic modeling, we can get into graphs that have millions of, of elements in them very quickly. And what this says is 
you could have relatively small source data, but a very large compute problem. Okay, if I want to do some complex analytics on that graph, some complex algorithms, it can uh, really chew up a lot of compute time, um, even though it's relatively small data. And so that's interesting. It does satisfy graph parallel systems. Um, so there's lots of data locality to leverage. You can do this in parallel, uh, whether you're doing it parallel on your multi-core laptop or parallel on a cluster, but still the same kind of thing. Um, now, I've shown before kind of an idealized uh, machine learning workflow. And uh, I, I use this as just kind of a template to think about uh, applications when I'm building them. But you know, typically, there's multiple data sources. There's a lot of work to clean up the data, some type of ETL. Uh, and then from there, you'll probably go in and spend a lot of time exploring. And exploring data, new data, is a hard problem. It's not something that's readily uh, automated. It really does require some understanding and some learning about the problem. Uh, you may be able to use some machine learning techniques to augment how you explore. You might be using some unsupervised learning, clustering, uh, et cetera. Uh, but typically, you know, you're not going to be doing a lot of modeling. Instead, this layer right here, or this stage, uh, is more about reporting and visualization. Uh, from there, you can move on to features. From there, move on to building some models. And then from there, evaluating the models. Feature engineering is a hard problem. Deep learning is one way to approach some autoencoding and alleviating some of the difficulties of feature engineering, but it's still going to be a hard problem. Uh, and the reason for that is that people really only think well in about three or four dimensions, not beyond that. Um, whereas in complex data sets, you can start to get thousands of dimensions very quickly. Uh, so features, feature engineering can be a very counterintuitive kind of thing. Um, evaluation is another part that's very difficult to automate, very, very hard to do, because if you don't evaluate your machine learning models the right way, you can really shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, that can be very sneaky. Um, so I wanted to show in red where the hard parts are in a typical kind of pipeline like this. Um, for what I'm showing in, in uh, this part here, we'll take it up to exploration and take a look at some queries, and then we'll do a little bit of feature engineering to prepare for building a model. Haven't quite got to the modeling yet. Um, so here, for uh, preparing the data and being able to do some, some exploring, um, first off, this is going to be based on, we're taking JSON documents for each message, and then using NLTK uh, to be able to do, actually there's a wrapper on top of NLTK that's called text blob. I really like that a lot better, uh, especially uh, some of the part of speech tagging, I think is, uh, it's better performance than what you see in NLTK. Um, but I've got, in Python, a scraper uh, for the email lists and then a parser to do a little bit of light parsing. I'll show examples of that. Um, also assigning unique IDs and uh, basically preparing the data so that it can be fit into graphs. Um, so here we're going to come from Apache email list and then we're going to crawl that. Um, one of the harder problems with email is that you get a lot of quoted text and maybe several levels of quoted text. So an issue there is being able to filter out the quoted text. And uh, you typically end up with fairly light, not a lot of data, not a lot of text. And that makes the text analytics more difficult. That's why this technique is used. Um, there's also segmentation and then uh, tagging that we do on the, on the messages. Um, so when we crawl, it comes out to a JSON doc that looks like this. And then when we parse it, um, we'll take that JSON and we'll go through the text, cut it into sentences, and then for each sentence, we'll split it into words. And then uh, for each word, um, tag it, determine is it a noun, is it an adjective, is it uh, a verb. Uh, if it's a noun or a verb, uh, for instance, if it's a plural noun, let's find the singular form. If it's a verb, let's find the root. So we'll find the most canonical form for that word. Um, and that's using some, sor some uh, sources out of NLTK, TreeBank and WordNet, um, WordNet to do the limitization. Uh, we also, in text blob, there's some sentiment analysis. So we can take a look at the sentences and start to score them, look at the paragraphs as well, and try to give them some scores, uh, you know, which direction is this leaning. And uh, another thing is, since we do have these lists of the sentences, and we have the words all segmented out, 
uh, we'll go through and we'll, we'll apply a technique called skipgrams, where we're taking a look at, say there's a, a noun, followed by uh, an adjective, and then further down the sentence there's a verb. Um, we'll take and create a, a skipgram with a window of three uh, and start to link some of the words together, again, into a graph, uh, if they're collocated. But also, if they happen to have the same root, we'll also link across the sentences. So by virtue of doing this, we'll take a piece of text, a paragraph, and convert it into a graph. And the graph is structured based on how the words are next to each other and how the words share meaning. Um, and so the idea of text rank is if you take that graph and run page rank on it, then the words that have essentially more syncs into them have more meaning applied, more reference. It's just like web pages that have more inbound links. And so by running page rank, then you can figure out which phrases are being most commonly referenced, and therefore they're probably the ones that are a better approximation of the text overall. Um, so it looks like this. If I take the, uh, the data coming in, uh, I've got that doc, I run it through my pipeline, and then coming out, I've got a, a paragraph that's segmented, I've got some kind of ID, um, I've got a, a couple of different metrics to describe the sentiment, uh, subjectivity and polarization, um, and, uh, and also I do some tiling, basically the skipgram to link the different words together that are related. Now, if you want to grab some of the da uh, data for this, I've got it all up, uh, several months of the Apache Spark list I have on a public S3 bucket. So if you want to try running this, um, the data is already scraped and parsed. Um, OK, so let me show some code uh, right here. And this is going to be in a notebook. I have this in a few formats. I was doing this off of Databricks, so it'll be Python. Um, in, sorry, I don't want this one. Um, I want this one. Uh, it'll be Python in a notebook, and I could run this in Jupyter, or I could run this in, uh, in, uh, in this case, in Databricks Cloud. Um, I just had it in Databricks Cloud, but I also exported it, so it could be run in Jupyter, and that's in the open source project. Um, the idea is that I take and uh, create an RDD that points to my collection of JSON documents, and I register the RDD as a temp table. And uh, so now it's in the catalog, and I can run SQL queries against it. Um, if I take a look for six months of data, there's, yeah, 13,000 messages. That makes sense. Um, if I take a look at uh, what a raw uh, message looks like, you see the, uh, the JSON there. Um, Spark is smart enough that when it reads in JSON, it can take a union across all the different documents in an RDD and then synthesize what is the schema. So once you read in the JSON, you can say print schema, and it'll show you what it thinks is the overall queryable schema. Um, so now that we've got this, we can start to do some queries. Uh, if I'm going to explore a community, uh, first off, I want to know who are the people involved. So a very simple query to find out uh, who are the senders. And then I actually create a map uh, so that each sender has a unique ID. Um, you know, it's a very simple pipeline here in, in Spark, but you can see I've got this data structure down here, basically a dictionary that describes um, the, the different senders involved, the different people and their email list involved, and uh, a unique ID for each. Okay, so now that I know who and I have IDs, um, let's start to refine this. What's interesting is, uh, let's see who are the most frequent senders. That's better information. I'd like to characterize them in more subtle ways, but the top K senders is important. Um, so here I'm actually doing in Python, in Spark, that's a word count, pretty much. Um, it would be very similar as if I were going to write as a word count, and then I've actually sorted it by key. Um, so if I print that out here, again, based on the functional programming uh, approach, I can show who the top K senders are, just printing that out as a, a list of key values. Or I could also express this as a SQL query, and then this will be translated down and run the same way as if I do the, the, the Python pipeline. Um, so here in our uh, community, you can see that Sean Owen from Cloudera is uh, he's out there a lot. And uh, Akil Das from Sigmoid is out there a lot. Michael Armbrust is actually the lead author on Spark SQL, so he's there, of course. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, these are really the people who are very much engaged 
Many of them are committers, and if they're not committers, they're consultants, uh, they're very much in the community. Okay, so top K, that's one way to look at the shape of the community. It's a very simple way to build a leaderboard. Maybe not the best. Um, let's take a look and see uh, count of messages compares with duration of time. One of the things I was really curious about is if there's like a, a drive-by email. Um, so if somebody comes in, they sort of get in the community, they fire off a lot of messages, and then they go away and they never come back. And so I wanted to try to come up with a metric for that. And what I'm doing here is I've set up a, a function. Um, the timestamps are all strings, so we're going to convert them and create a float out of that. Um, and then from there, we're going to take a look at date ranges in a numeric way and find out if a particular person who is, seems to be engaged in the community, if they're actually there consistently. Are they there over a long period of time? Um, so we're basically uh, taking a look at the, the count, the frequency of them engaging, uh, along with the duration of them engaging. Look at two dimensions. And uh, for those of you who are into that sort of thing, uh, Pareto fronts might be a good way to describe that. Um, OK, so here's a query to show count and duration now after I have transformed the data here in this pipeline. I'm basically creating a different data frame. And then I query against it. And it turns out Sean Owen is there almost every day. And um, I, I should talk to his boss about that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Sean's a great guy. And he's very, very much part of the Spark community. Um, so the rankings here didn't change a whole lot. The people who are there are pretty much there all the time. Um, some of them did shift, and that's interesting. And I could add more dimensions to try to quantify who, what does this community look like. Um, but uh, this is good, because it really, these names are very familiar. These are people who are in, uh, you know, they're, they're the speakers at Spark Summit, a lot, most of them. Um, OK, I want to try to understand a little bit more about the community. So here, we're going to take a look and say, well, uh, we want to look at the subject of the message, and we want to look at the sender. And then we want to look at the person who replies. So the, the reply message, look at the sender for that and call them a, a, a well, we've got sender and receiver. Um, and uh, OK, so basically we can come out and say, well, here's a list of different people who are responding to each other about particular topics. So that's interesting. Who talks with whom? Um, and particularly for the, the high frequency topics, this is very interesting because it means that pairs of people are engaged on the same topic uh, repeatedly or over a period of time. Um, and that's an important thing to understand about your community. Um, sometimes people answer themselves. And so here's a person, uh, actually, let me do uh, there. <laughs> so here's somebody who answered his own message uh, 36 times. So that's interesting. Um, apparently, knew a lot about this topic. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I should actually send email to this person to find out what was going on there. Um, but we, we do see some of these kind of artifacts. And you know, maybe that's good to filter out. Um, it's not, it doesn't really fit the kind of model we're trying to do with graphs. Um, OK, so let's see here. Uh, send a replier. I wanted to get some counts on who are the couplets of people, the, basically the pairs in the graph, who seem to be, seem to be talking with each other very frequently. Um, and that's interesting, because I might want to see what company they come from or what organization they're in. Uh, maybe that's consistent, or maybe, maybe there's a consulting firm that's helping out a client over the list. That definitely happens a lot, too. Um, OK, good. So those are flavors of different queries that we can do to try to understand, just even looking from timestamps and subjects and, and the, uh, you know, the from, uh, uh, from headers, we can start to figure out some of the dynamics of the list. But I'd like to go a lot deeper. Um, there. OK, so what I'm going to do is build up a large scale graph. And I'm going to do this using Parquet. Um, so I, I'll take uh, the edges, and I'm going to overlay some types on them, and then write out a parquet file to represent all of the edges. And then I'll do the same thing with the nodes. I'll overlay types on those and write it out as parquet file. Uh, how many folks have used parquet? Some? OK, let's say 5 10%. The idea of parquet is this. If you have a record, and you have a lot of fields in a record, so you have 100 fields in a record. Uh, when you go to store your data, you could take it row by row. 
And if you're going to compress the data, well, that's interesting. Each row will be compressed, let's say that. Or maybe just the whole file is compressed. Another way to organize this would be to say, organize, um, basically split it on the columns and compress the columns together. That makes more sense because logically within a column, you'll probably see repeats of data values. So there's probably more opportunities to get better compression there. Uh, so that's great. So Parquet will look at things in a column-wise way and do some really great compression on the data. Now that actually fits well with key value stores, with some of the columnar storage uh, frameworks like Cassandra or Vertica, Accumulo, etc. Um, so now we've got a nice way to serialize the data that fits well with these distributed frameworks. But there's more to it than that. Parquet can also take predicates, push down predicates. So if I have uh, expressed in PySpark a pipeline and it has a filter uh, and I'm doing some kind of select, um, I could ostensibly take those predicates and instead of doing them in Spark, I could push them all the way down into Parquet. And uh, that's where you get really great optimizations because Parquet is smart enough to say, number one, I've got 100 columns in my record. I'm only going to query three of them. So first off, let's only you know, decompress, deserialize those three columns. Forget everything else. So you get huge efficiencies there. Number two, if you've got these predicates that would be up in the pipeline, but you can push them down like a filter scan, great. We'll do that while we're decompressing the data. And boom, we have all kinds of savings. And then uh, another point is something called cogen. Um, it's possible to say, look at the closures of what's being described in PySpark and compile those and send that down into Parquet so it's actually not interpreting but running compiled code. Um, and cogen will get by you a lot, lot more. So Parquet is a really nice practice. There's also OCR, and there's, there's some others that I've, I've heard of in the works. Um, but these are really great ways to handle your storage, because Spark itself doesn't do really anything for storage. Um, so now I've got some data to be able to do some graph analysis. And I better get going here on this talk. Um, how late I have? OK, good. Um, here I've got. Uh, a graph, okay, what I'm gonna do is not just keep a graph of the people who are talking to each other, I'm gonna keep a graph of all the text semantically. So recall that earlier on, each message was split into sentences and the sentences were parsed and then they were tagged. Um, and then with the skipgrams, we constructed a graph out of each, each text document. So we're gonna take that each word is going to be a node, and then the, the links between them are the edges. And we'll do a similar thing where we write these out as parquet. Um, so we've got graph edge and graph node as parquet. Um, OK, now at this time, I'm going to do something that's uh, complete heresy. But I'll show a little bit of Scala, because so far they have not got this in Python yet. But we've prepared all the data in Python. So I think, is that fair? Anybody give me permission? OK, good. Uh, so this is kind of fun. Um, this is a type of text analytics, NLP, that uh, used to be really expensive, and so it wasn't done very much. But now it's getting cheaper. And so what we'll do is, first off, read in the Parquet files. Now, with Spark, you have this thing called lazy evaluation. So when I say read it in, all I'm doing is defining a graph to be executed later. Um, I'm not actually reading in all that data. And so that's nice, because it's Parquet, so maybe I can prune some columns or push some predicates. Um, I'm just, for this one here, I'm just going to tie it to one message so that it's easier to actually see the results. But it could be running the whole graph at the time. And now um, I'll import some the graphics libraries and uh, read in the, uh, the nodes and then uh, convert them to RDD and then read in the edges and convert them to RDD. Um, and this is the nodes and edges for the, uh, the parsed text. Uh, I'll take those two RDDs and compose them into a graph right here. So I get a graph G. And then I run PageRank. And in GraphX, you know, this is a one-line call. Uh, PageRank is implemented in Preggle. It's about five lines in Preggle, but it's already there and optimized. So I say PageRank, and I give it a conversion uh, threshold right there. And once that's calculated, um, I'll just grab the vertices out of the results, uh, basically the ranks for each word. That'll be a vector. 
Um, and when I ran this on a small cluster, it took like 16 seconds, no big deal. That was, that was actually pretty good. Um, and now I've got a vector of the different ranks and the different words. I'll overlay a little schema on them and register it, uh, create a data frame, register as a temp table, and then I can query against it. So looking at this one particular message, if I look at the ranks that came out of page rank, memory has a certain rank, uh, persist, et cetera, et cetera. I've got the highly ranked words. That's like keyword analysis. It's not really all that great. Um, so what I'd like to do is instead basically pull a thread. So for every highly ranked word, I'm going to take a look at its surrounding noun phrase and just pull the thread on those and uh, aggregate the ranks together. And I'll come up with this other metric that describes basically which are the most highly ranked phrases. This is a way of doing automated document summarization. So if you've ever read a scientific paper and they've got the column where somebody's abstracted it and they've got some key phrases to describe the paper, that's a way of doing it automatically. Um, so here I will take and read back in the fully parsed data and register that and do a little bit of join. Um, oh, well, actually, we'll just take a look at this particular message and see what's in there. There's the parsed data. And then here, um, let me scoot down a little bit. What I'm going to do is a little bit of Scala to take and extract out, basically pull the thread on the noun phrases, extract out those and aggregate their, uh, their page ranks together. And once I do that, I've got phrases. Let's query that. It comes out and it says, okay, memory crunch is the top ranked. MapReduce operations is next. Iterative algorithms is next. Uh, memory persists, et cetera. And that's great because when you look at the raw text, it's right here. I don't know, is that readable? Is that big enough? Maybe a little bigger? Um, when you look at the raw text, you know, they said only fit the data in memory where you want to run the iterative algorithm. For MapReduce operations, it's better not to cache if you have a memory crunch. Uh, so it actually did pick up the right noun phrases. Now, there's a, a really cheap and dirty way of doing that, noun phrase chunking, uh, but it gets, yeah, the results are muscle menos. It's, 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 it's a, a little dicey. Uh, so I wanted to have something that would hit and, and, and get the right noun phrases in, in a much uh, more reliable way. TextRank will do that. It is a graph algorithm. It's relatively expensive. Um, but if you can do TextRank in parallel, it's, it's working out pretty well. Um, now, if you were just to do this in terms of keyword analysis, you would see the, you, memory, to, and well, basically a really flat view of this message. It's not as rich. OK, so let's scoot back over. Um, I'm going to skip the Docker section in the interest of time. Um, basically, this algorithm, TextRank, was done by Rada Milhasia and Paul Toro at UNT. Uh, Rada's at Michigan now. Um, and there are implementations in English, Spanish, and um, Icelandic also, if you need Icelandic. Um, and uh, you know, here's like a really heavy, dense math paragraph out of a paper and uh, talking about uh, linear Diophantine equations. But you see it creates a graph, and then it doesn't really care what's in there. Light parsing, a little bit of semantic markup, and then blam, you just do page rank on it. OK. Um, social graph is the last thing I'll do. Uh, I also took and ran the, the connection of people talking with each other. And so we did page rank on that. Um, it's better than looking and seeing who are the top K. You're actually looking at who is referencing whom. So you build up a much richer view of who are the important influencers uh, in this community. And we can take a look at max in degree, max out degree, et cetera, et cetera, connected components, et cetera. Um, basically, it comes out like this. You do have a different ranking. Uh, the top three are still preserved, uh, but then other people move up and down. And it does actually, I think, represent better in terms of the dynamics of this community. I used to be the evangelist for Apache Spark, so. You know, that's kind of my experience is who's who in the community. Um, but Sean Owen is definitely up at top. Um, and another thing that popped out of this, I don't think we show it there, uh, connected components. Basically, are there cliques in the graph? And as it turned out, no. Um, this graph it does not have a lot of little cliques. And it's because the, uh, the committers are actually really active, engaging with all the new people who come in, all the intro questions. Um, so you get a lot of connectivity across the graph. Um, so that was a pretty interesting learning. But now we can take and point it to a bunch of other types of forms as well, not just, not just Spark. 
Um, and so what we're doing is to put this into a notebook and publish it through Jupyter and uh, come up with leaderboards to describe a variety of popular uh, open source projects and you know who, who's who in the community and who should you go talk with. Uh, we think that that'll be interesting to surface. Um, there's a lot of other ways to try to quantify or understand these communities, but it's a, a pretty interesting kind of metric. Alrighty, I think I'm probably over time. I know we started late, um, but are there any questions I could take just real brief? Yes. I might have missed it, but are these slides available? Yeah, most certainly, yeah. I, I have on slideshare.net, I am Pacoid. I'm a Paco humanoid, so Pacoid. <laughs> and I've actually got a few different versions of this one. Other questions? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that was one of the points of using uh, text blob. So it's a, text blob is a, a Python layer on top of NLTK, uh, on top of WordNet. Uh, and they have a really nice statistical, well, they have a nice parser, nice segmentation. But what I found was the part of speech tagger there was much better than any other I could find. And I ran tests across a variety of different ones. So I like the Python library the best. Um, and one of the things I do is, in the original paper, Rada used uh, uh, Porter Stimmer and you know, got reasonable results. I went back in and did lemmatization, which is to say I do lookups. After I parse the sentence, I look up the, the word in WordNet, and if it's a verb, I find its root. And so you actually get a much cleaner representation this way and better convergence. You can take it a step further. If you want to do something akin to a random walk, you can go into WordNet and look at, if you're familiar with like hypernyms and hyponyms, you can take and start to build out the graph based on looking at the word sense vectors and build out other edges. And uh, you get a denser graph and it converges better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're out there. I mean, you could do, a lot of those are like chunking kind of things. Um, and I've compared them. I use this for a uh, custom search engine for Rolling Stone, part of how they surface their back catalog and you know, get advertising revenue off of that. And, uh, and we did some bake-offs on this. And, and this will definitely give you, uh, for most of the articles, we were getting better performance here. Oh, we were also doing co-occurrence. We were doing a variety, kind of built this ensemble of different approaches. But uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we took the results and dropped them into Lucene so we could do fast lookups. Um, and so we would compare it against other albums that way. Good question. Any other questions? Probably the other talk is coming in here soon, so um, I can take some questions off to the side. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.